but to recognize that this is an opportunity for us to just stop with everything else and not forget it, but to recommit our gifts, ourselves, our talents, to recommit who and what we are to the service of Jesus Christ. With that in mind, let's go together in prayer. Holy God, we thank you. We thank you for the many ways in which you bless us. And certainly, certainly, we're reminded of how you gave us Jesus Christ when we were so undeserving. While we were still in rebellion, you gave him to us. And that he died for us. And so in humble gratitude, we, we bring our gifts. We can't repay him. We can't buy him off. But we can give. And we can show our, our gratitude. And we can take the way that you've created us and say, use me now, Lord. That we can take the spiritual gifts that you've granted to us and say, use these gifts. Give me the grace to use these gifts. That we can dedicate <clears throat> our energies to the ministries of this church and the greater church. That we can dedicate our thoughts and our minds and, the, and our words in our daily lives, to our individual ministries in your name. That we can, in so many ways, be a blessing to folks who do not know you and be a blessing to those who are being discipled, to be a blessing to those who are the greater church at large. And that in doing those things, we bring blessing upon your name. So Father, please, hear now the thoughts of our minds. Feel now the thoughts of our hearts, understand our spirit as we bring these our gifts and offer them in the name of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Our hymn this morning is hymn number 560 if you're using a hymnal from Scotch Plains Baptist. It's also included right there in your worship packet. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. And that's certainly a great song to sing for our offertory hymn. As we give ourselves, we trust Him. We don't have to give with a little bit of trepidation. We don't have to be a little timid. We don't have to be a little nervous about, I don't know if this is the right thing. We trust Him because we have proven Him over and over. Let's sing together. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. You may stand if you care. <laughs>
invite you to be seated. In just a moment, we're going to join together in our pastoral prayer. Pastoral not because it's the pastor who has the microphone, but pastoral in that it's our care for the sheep of the pasture. It's our care for one another. It's our care for the flock. And so it's not my prayer. It's our prayer joined together and our individual prayers that are for the common good of the people. And it's not limited to the good of the people who are gathered in the sanctuary or who are participating live in some way in the service or even those who are watching a recording of the service when the prayer is made. But it's our care for all those for whom we care. And so it extends beyond the church family. And so we lift up co-workers and classmates. And we lift up um, our neighbor. We lift up people that we don't know, but we've seen the headlines. Or we saw the, the flashing lights of emergency vehicles. And we lift up the unknown. We lift up issues. We lift up hunger. Racism, injustice, war. And we might not always have a specific face or name in mind when we lift those things, but we know how insidious those things can be. We also lift up joy, lift up neighborliness. Hospitality, grace. And we pray for these things, even if we might not have a specific name or face to put with them, but we know that these are things that make the world better. And we offer those things. And we offer all these prayers in the name of Jesus. So I don't I don't I don't know if you have this feeling sometimes, but you hear people say, well, our thoughts and prayers are with them. Or sending good vibes. Well, yeah, I, I, I guess there's some good vibes. And I guess the thoughts, but for me, the most powerful of those things is the prayer. The prayer in the name of Jesus. Now, I recognize that it's probably folks who are saying, well, I, I, I don't want to offend my non-praying friends or network. And I want them to know that I'm thinking of them. But for me, it's prayer in the name of Jesus. And so yeah, I have good thoughts about some of the things we've talked about earlier today or that have been expressed in prayer lists throughout the week. But I, I'm offering prayer. It also kind of bothers me when you see people say, well, I'm sending prayers your way. Well, I understand what you're saying, but that's, that doesn't kind of fit my idea of prayer. I'm sending prayers on your behalf, but I'm sending them heaven's way. I'm sending them in the name of Jesus. Now, I hope I didn't step on anybody's toes because I know that I use kind of those thoughts too sometimes. And I've expressed those things sometimes because I've known who my audience was and that they weren't going to join me in my prayer. So I've used some of those other words, but I've also put in prayer. Because to me, I think that's what we're really getting at. And that's where the power really comes. Let's pray together our pastoral prayer. Holy God, we thank you. We thank you for life in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the many things that, because we've seen life in Jesus Christ and we have seen the blessings that he's given, since we've seen victories in so many ways, we give you praise. We see joy and grace. We see healing and reconciliation. We've seen peace. 
So we praise you and thank you. And we ask, Lord, for just a little more of it. And that in whatever part we can play, that we would have the grace to do so. That we'd have the gumption to be a part of the peacemaking, of the reconciling, of the sharing of goodness, mercy, of love. That we just have a little more of kindness and gentleness. That we could show your hospitality. And Lord, because we've seen how you've done those things, because we have proven you over and over, there's some things that have been on our minds. And we yield them to you. We bring those who are even now grieving, and those who are dealing with diagnoses, those facing tests, those awaiting results, we bring before you employment situations and school situations, relationships in our families, in our communities, and among peoples and countries. We bring before you financial anxiety, questioning of how and where. We bring before you spiritual needs. We bring before you our angst and our malaise, our questioning, our stubbornness. We bring before you loved ones who just need to know who you are and feel your presence. Those that we've been praying will come to know you personally as Lord and Savior. And we pray for our actions towards that. And the ways that we can be the answer to some other family's prayer, that we could be in someone's life and show them the way. Father, we bring so many challenges, fears, doubts, concerns, so many things that we, we wish we could fix. We turn them over to you. And we announce our readiness to be part of the answer to use who and what we are to help meet some of those needs. And Lord, that we'll be a little better today than we were yesterday. That through you and by your power that we can do a little bit more today for your kingdom. That you'll equip us for whatever you have before us tomorrow as we seek to share with the world these things that we have known through you. And sometimes in simple gestures that might be overlooked by others, but might lay a ground. And at other times, by bold moves and bolder words, as we proclaim your name. Use us, Jesus, to do your work, to do what you've laid out for us, to live your name in front of others. It's in that name we pray. Amen. To choose words carefully. I don't always succeed at it. I'm not always good at it. 
but I, I try to. Um, one of the challenges is I am not necessarily the most expressive person. You've heard me say, and, and probably more times than you care to count, you've heard me say that my wife has described me as being emotionally constipated. Um, I tend to not have a whole lot of highs and lows. Um, and part of that is just kind of my, my personality, who I am, how I was brought up. But, but let, me, let me give you a kind of defining moment for me that tends to make me a little bit guarded. When I was in college, um, I began seeing this girl casually. Um, and we were friends more than anything else. Um, but she ended up going to the hospital. And she had to be hospitalized. And she had a, an issue that kept her there uh, for a couple of days. Uh, and there was a hospital right on our, our campus, even though we had a very small college, less than a thousand students, there was a hospital on campus. Um, and I went to the campus bookstore and I was going to buy a get well card. And uh, another thing about me, uh, I'm also cheap. And I looked at the get well cards and saw how much they cost, but they also had a section of posters. And I don't know if you remember when you used to go in and you flip through posters, they were on those plastic racks and you kind of flip through and laugh at them and never buy anything. Um, well, there was one that had this little bunny on it. Um, and I think it said something to the effect of, somebody cares for you. And it was about half the price of a greeting card. So I bought that, and on the bottom of it I wrote, get well soon, love chat. I thought that was a standard sign off on things. You know, how many cards have you gotten that had that, or how many letters did you write, and you know, instead of saying yours truly or at your service, you ended it with love, comma, and your name. Well, that came back to haunt me uh, several weeks later when the relationship had developed a little bit more, um, but apparently in her mind it had developed further than it had in my mind, and we had a bit of a discussion uh, where she said, you don't tell me you love me anymore. And I said, I don't. I think I ever said that. Um, well, here, she took that I signed that card, or that poster that said, somebody cares for you, and I signed it, love Chaz, that that was me saying, I love you. I don't sign anything, love Chaz, anymore, unless it's for my wife, or love dad, to my daughter. I had not said that to girls. And I didn't think that writing it on a poster that was my cheap out of a get well card should have counted. But I guard my language quite a bit. And I, I gotta be honest, um, my, my family, we don't end phone calls. Well, actually some of them have started to, but it hasn't caught on with me anyway. We don't end phone calls with, all right, I love you, talk to you later. We end with, all right, talk to you later. As my wife says, you never even say goodbye on the phone. You're just like, all right, next time. And it reminds me of a, a very old, very bad joke about the couple that had been married for 50 years. And the wife said the same line that this girl had said to me, you don't say you love me anymore. And he said, look, on our wedding day, I said I love you. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> I'm not quite that bad. But that does make me think of a, a song. Are you surprised? It makes me think of a song. Actually, uh, we were at that special Olympics practice yesterday, and something happened, and one of the moms was standing there, and a line was said, and I gave a, a, a song lyric, and she said, you have a song for everything. I said, yes, just be glad that most of them aren't show tunes, and I don't dance to them as well. Um, she did appreciate that. Uh, but this one actually is kind of a show tune. Um, in 1964, a very good year, I might say, um, 
Fiddler on the Roof came out. Uh, and it was nominated for 10 Tonys. And it won nine out of the 10 nominations. And it got best musical, best score, best book. And I grew up with this, literally grew up with this music. My father had it on an LP. You've heard me talk about that and how he would uh, often on Saturday morning play If I Were a Rich Man. And it would blast through the house on that big stereo console system. But another song on that soundtrack was between the protagonist and his wife, between Goli and Te Tevia and Goli. Um, and they were dealing with so much change. It, it, if you haven't seen it for a while, I actually watched the whole thing, um, well, probably within the past three months, I probably watched Fiddler on the Roof. Um, it's change in this little community. It's change on the political level. It's change on a cultural level. And, it, and for, for Tevya, it's change on such a personal level. Um, you might remember uh, Yenta the matchmaker in there um, and trying to match everybody up. Well, here, Tevya's daughters don't want a matchmaker. They want to choose their own spouses. And he's confronted with this kind of cultural change. It's, it's, it's hard for him. And he tries to process it. And, and I, I love the Tevye character. Um, and again, I, we see Fiddler on the Roof, uh, I don't know how many high school or college productions that you've gone to. Or, uh, and I, I just love Tevye with his, on the one hand, and on the other hand, but on the other hand, and on the other hand. And he kind of goes back and forth. And he's struggling with this. And um, I, I actually watched this Late last night, I, I, I found a clip on YouTube and I watched the scene from the, the movie. And he's talking to his wife about their daughter, Paul. And she's getting married. And there was no matchmaker. They really had nothing to do with it. And he's struggling with this, and his eyes are opening to how things might be changing, and what does it mean, and, and, and new thought patterns. And what's, to me, kind of a neat gimmick about the song is that some of the times there's speaking parts, and some of the times there's singing parts, and a lot of the time it's transitioning from speaking into singing. Mid sentence. And to me, it kind of takes that idea of here I stand speaking in the real world, but now I am singing in kind of the thought world, in the world of emotion. Question. And so it starts, and, and oh, and she starts singing along with him. Um, but it starts with him saying, he's a good man, Goli. I like him. And what's more important, Hoddle likes him. Hoddle loves him. So what can we do? It's a new world. A new world. Love. Goldie, do you love me? And he kind of half sings that line. And she looks at him and doesn't sing, but she just says, Do I what? Do you love me? Do I love you? With our daughters getting married and this trouble in the town, you're upset, you're worn out, go inside, go lie down. Maybe it's indigestion. And Tevye says, Goldie, I'm asking you a question. And he sings, do you love me? She says, oh, you're a fool. He says, I know. But do you love me? She sings, do I love you? For 25 years, I've washed your clothes, cooked your meals, cleaned your house, given you children, milked the cow. After 25 years, why talk about love now? 
Tevye looks at her and says, Goldie. And he started saying, Goldie, the first time I met you was on our wedding day. I was scared. I was shy. I was nervous. So was I. But my father and my mother said we'd learn to love each other. And now I'm asking Goldie, do you love me? And she sings back, I'm your wife. I know. But do you love me? And then Goldie kind of sings to herself, do I love him? And she's now thinking about it for the first time. For 25 years I've lived with him, fought him, starved with him. 25 years my bed is his. If that's not love, what is? And Tevye's face kind of lights up. He says, then, he sings, then you love me. She says, I suppose I do. And he sings back, and I suppose I love you too. And they sit down next to each other. And they don't look at each other, but they kind of look off. And they sing together. It doesn't change a thing. But even so, after 25 years, it's nice to know when they both smile. Now, I gotta tell you, when I was hearing that as a kid, it didn't mean so much. It was a nice song between some old folks. Kind of moved the story along of now we got to think about what's important in society. But the older I get, the more power there is in there. In asking and answering the question, do you love me? I'm thinking about what love is. What does it mean to answer that? I, I, I think you get that in, in Goldie's thought process. I've, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. I guess that's love. But when the next generation is choosing their life partners based on love, and our parents chose our life partners on a good match, How do we fit into that world? How do we fit? And it's good to know. Well, our text today is a familiar passage to you. That really kind of gets to, do you love me? It's from John chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. Now, where we ended last week with John chapter 20 was a pretty suitable ending to the gospel. But this kind of gives us a, more a, like an epilogue, you know, to see, now that we've said that, let's take a glimpse of what, how it unfolds, what it looks like. And so we get to John chapter 21. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way, Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. Now this sounds like a familiar story that you've already heard. And I think that's why John included it here. Because he knew that you heard of a similar event. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And again, because this is post-resurrection. Uh, he's made an appearance. He's, he's appeared to them. Um, he's appeared to them, in, including Thomas, the one who said, unless I see and touch, I'm not going to believe. And then he saw and he believed without touching. Now Thomas is part of that group as well. They'd all go with Simon, with Peter, to fish. Kind of go back to what you know. Back to now that after three years everything has changed and I guess fishing makes the most sense. And they go with him. They've seen Jesus in that upper room. He's appeared to them. But now he's there on the shore, you know, a little bit of a distance. Maybe hard to distinguish and let's face it, 
their first assumption would not be the one who had died. Even the one who had appeared to them, because the appearances had been kind of limited. And certainly not while they were out fishing. So they didn't realize who it was. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Yeah, kind of a familiar theme. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, where they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And again, I don't know about you, but from a hundred yards away, from one end of the football field to the other, would I have recognized somebody who, even if I saw them there, assumed he wouldn't be there? You know how when you see somebody from totally out of context? Would I have recognized Jesus from that far away? But apparently John had, the disciple whom Jesus loved, he was the one that said it is the Lord. But do you notice when he recognized him? After they had caught the fish. Didn't recognize him from seeing him, didn't recognize him by his words when he asked friends have you any fish, or when he said throw you out on the other side, you'll find some. He recognized him after they did that. After they had caught nothing, throw the net on the right side of the boat, pull it in, and it's full of fish. Then it's the Lord. So I don't think he recognized him physically. I don't think he recognized him audibly. I think he recognized him by the action. By the fruit. By what was produced. And Peter believed him and jumped in. Now this time, Peter didn't walk on top of the water. But he walked through it. He jumped in and they went. And the rest followed with the boat. Typical kind of Peter, he left them to, in his enthusiasm and his excitement. I don't think he meant to leave them with the work to do, but he was so excited about Jesus that he left it behind. Hmm. He left the fishing behind to go to Jesus. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon, Peter, climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Now, I got to tell you, that, that kind of throws me a little bit. They knew it, but they kind of wanted to be sure. They wanted to ask, who are you? But they knew it was Jesus, and they, they were, I mean, they were almost certain. But just in case it wasn't, they wanted to ask, but then, how does that make you feel? How would that make Jesus feel? That, so who are you again? It's me. We spent all these years together. I, I was the one that walked with you and taught you and, and showed you. I was there for how many of these miracles and I was the one that just gave you a command to love one another. I told you that my body was going to be broken, my blood shed and I died and I appeared to you. I came in that room, you should know who I am. But they were right on that edge. They had a little bit of doubt. They, they know, but maybe they don't know, but they're not going to ask. You ever bump into somebody in the grocery store and you know you know them, but you can't figure out how you know them? And you don't want to give it away, so you say, hey, yeah, hey, how's it been? Long time. You don't want to ask the question, who are you again? I gotta tell you, I encounter that a lot with kids who grew up in the day school. And let's face it, even when they're here, there's so many kids that I might not get all their names, I might recognize the faces, but if it's five years from now and they run into me and say, Pastor Chaz! Well, they say, Pastor Chaz, I know it's the day school, but I have no idea who they are. They're looking at 
Jesus. And they know it's him, but is it? Could it be? How does it make sense? Verse 13, Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And we see so many kind of callbacks to previous episodes with the disciples. Not catching fish, catching them now because he says to do something different. Recognizing him when you shouldn't. Jumping out of the boat to go to him, whether you're walking on water or sinking. Taking loaves and fishes and feeding. Taking bread and maybe saying words that took them back to that last supper, that so recent but so long ago Passover. Sharing the simple things with them. So many reminders. So many reminders of, of Peter, who was a fisherman who became a fisher of men. I mean, that's what Jesus told him he'd be. I mean, when we go back far enough, isn't that what Jesus told him? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they spent years with him. And they did draw some crowds. And some people believed. But how much of the fishing was Peter doing? When I was a kid, my dad was uh, involved in a, in a fishing club and a separate hunting club. A lot of the same, a lot of overlap. A lot of his, uh, his uncles had founded both of them. And, I would go fishing with my dad. Now I gotta tell you, I distinctly remember the very first time I went fishing with him. I probably shouldn't tell this story. Don't tell anybody this one. No. It, was, it was right down the road from where we lived. I grew up on just about road off of Bebout Road. And down Bebout towards Venetia was a set of ponds surrounded by a big fence. And it was a pay to fish place. Lake Joanne. And my father and my uncle were down at Lake Joanne fishing. And somebody, and I don't remember, I can remember it happening, but I don't remember who was on which end. But somebody didn't want to pay for the little me to fish. So somebody lifted me over the fence and handed me to somebody else. That's why we can't tell the story outside of here. And I do remember that it was Uncle Bob who fixed up my fishing rod for me. He found a stick about yay long. And he found some tangled up fish line on the side of the lake. And he tied it onto there and he tied another little broken stick onto the end of that fish line and had me cast that out in the water and wait to fish. I think I might know why they didn't want to pay for me to fish. That was my first fishing trip with Dad. Was I really fishing? No. But I was alongside, I was learning, I was probably hearing things about fishing. Knowing my, my father and my Uncle Bob, they were talking about fishing stories, they were talking about casting, they were talking about rods. I was probably learning some, but I really wasn't fishing. And I wonder if Peter, after three years, said, I was never really a fisher of men. I went with the man who was fishing for men. I witnessed the stories. I felt the stories. But I really wasn't a fisher of men. I saw the great fisher. I learned, I heard, but I really, really didn't. And what if that was in his mind as they were sitting together when he was with Thomas and Nathaniel 
and James and John and two other disciples. I wonder if he was sitting there and that was kind of playing in his mind when he said, you know what, boys, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to real fishing. Maybe I'll never be a fisher of men. He's gone. It's done. It's over. It's time to get back to reality. I wonder if that's what Peter's thinking even as he sits there in such a familiar setting around the fire, eating together with Jesus and his friends. I wonder if he's thinking there went three years and it's over. Certainly when we get to this passage, we think about Peter and how he at one point, just days ago, had told Jesus, I'll go wherever you go. Really? Will you? Before the night's over, you're going to deny me three times. Really, Peter? I wonder if while they're sitting there eating, and maybe, maybe others are laughing, and Peter's just kind of almost tuning it all out, and looking down at the sand, Maybe playing with a couple of pebbles. Thinking of that time that Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. And then thinking of the time when he said, on that rock I'll build my church. And then thinking of that time that I said I didn't even know him. I just picture Peter sitting there. Dropping these little pebbles, picking them up again. When they had finished, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? I want to stop right there before we get to the answer. You know the answer. But before we get there, I don't, I don't imagine that this happened with just Jesus and Peter looking eye to eye and question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. I don't think it was just like, Peter, do you love me? Yes. Peter, do you love me? Yes. Peter, do you love me? I think it was while they were gathered around. And have you ever sat around a campfire? Maybe not eating bread and fish, but you sat around a campfire. You know how conversation kind of goes around. There's a little side conversation. You come back and you tell a story. Maybe you haven't sat around a campfire, but maybe you, you sat around the table and the meal's done and you've eaten dessert. Maybe stuff has been cleared, but you're still sitting around and you're still talking. I have a feeling that these questions were kind of peppered into the conversation. That every now and then, in the midst of everything else, it was time. I mean, these guys have been together for so long and Jesus had died and what does this all mean? And Can you believe how many fish we caught? And Jesus looks over at Peter. Do you love me? Yes. You know I love you. Maybe Peter's head slow down, tossing pebbles. And then maybe Jesus talks to somebody else for a little bit. Maybe he talks to Thomas. Hey, Thomas, remember when, when I said I was going to Jerusalem and nobody wanted to go, and you stood up and said, well, we might as well all go and die with them. Remember that? Hey, Thomas, remember when you said you weren't going to believe unless you stuck your hand in my side and I showed up and you weren't going anywhere near? And then he glanced over again at Peter. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Take care of my sheep. And he gets in that third time. And now Peter's hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? Why is Peter hurt? 
Why, don't, don't you believe me when I say it? You're going to keep asking me? I already said it. I said it twice. Don't you believe me? Don't you trust me? Is it because I denied you? Is it because I made bold claims and then I didn't live up to it and now you're just kind of humiliating me? Can you imagine all the emotions that are going through with Peter? Can you imagine what you might be feeling in that, in that, in that whole big, tiny moment? So much is crammed into just these simple words. I mean, we're complex people. We can have more, emotion, more than one emotion at a time. My thoughts sometimes ping pong all over the place. What's Peter feeling when Jesus asked him the third time? Now, he's hurt. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. He asked him three times. He gets three responses. Three times he gives him the same idea. Maybe not the exact same words. And, and you've been around long enough that you know that the... Words that we translate love come from different Greek words. and all. You, You've heard that. You've, you've heard the, the balancing the three denials with the three opportunities to say, yes, I love you. Jesus again says, feed my sheep. He links that idea each time with this idea of loving me. If you love me, then do this. You love me, then do this. You love me, then do this. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death to which, by which Peter would glorify God. The idea that Peter, who said he followed Jesus, was eventually crucified. The tradition tells us as Jesus was, but not exactly, but stretched out his hand and gave himself up. But also, probably in there, the little idea that, you know, when you were young, you dressed yourself. When you first started coming with me, you really didn't know much about fishing. It was like I gave you a a stick with a old piece of line on it with a, not an actual hook and no real bait just getting used to the idea of sitting and being patient and putting the line in the water but you learn you started dressing yourself maybe not so great but you started dressing yourself and you learned a little more about fishing you learned a little bit more about what it means to be my disciple You made bold claims about how far you would go to follow me. And I questioned you. And I warned you that you were going to deny me. And you did it. But I'm going to tell you now that there will come a time when you will follow me all the way. And verse 19 ends with, Then he said to him, Follow me. The same words that he had said when he said, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, Peter. And you might not have seemed like you were much of a fisherman. You might not have seemed like you ever really got a chance. But now, follow me and feed my sheep. Follow me and be a fisher of men. Follow me. Cast out a net in a way that you've never thought of before. Trust me. You will bring in a haul of fish. You will bring in a haul of men. You will change the world. Follow me. And I wonder, if John didn't put this epilogue in there, with all these kind of callbacks to earlier episodes, with all this kind of balance and symbolism, so that we too could again hear those words, Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my lambs. 
Do you love me? Take care of my sheep. Follow me. If we love him, we follow him. We do the work that he set out. I should have reminded you earlier, just in case, but there is, we are going to have communion. There are communion sets at the back on my right. But I think that this kind of gets us there, doesn't it? It gets us back to taking the bread and taking the cup, doing this in remembrance. Why are we going to remember? We remember for ourselves. We remember what he's done for us. But in that remembering, we hear these old stories. We go back to that journey. And like Peter, perhaps we have some low spots. And we have an opportunity here to say, yes, Lord, I love you. I know what you've done. To hear him say, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep. We have a chance here to rededicate ourselves to follow him to be reminded that when he took that Passover meal and made it the Lord's Supper when he took, a, took one commemoration and made it commemorate something else when he gave us the command to do this in remembrance it was the same night that he gave the command love one another Maybe like Peter, sitting there on the shore of the sea with his friends, companions, with his Lord. Simple meal of bread and fish. He remembers. He recommits to follow. He took the bread and when he blessed it, he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance. I wonder if those disciples sitting at that campfire breakfast saw Jesus break the bread and came back to this table and remembered. And if they remembered how he took the cup and he said, this is a new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And we remember. And we recommit to be out there and be pastoral, to take care of the lambs and the sheep, to follow him, to become fishers of men. Let's pray together. Holy God, thank you. Thank you for what was done through Jesus Christ, what was done through Jesus Christ for all who will believe, what was done through Jesus Christ for me. Allow me to hear in the words of Scripture my story. To hear the Lord calling on me, to hear the Lord after I have denied Him. Lord, give me a chance to restate my love and to be entrusted with the sheep that belong to the great shepherd. Allow each of us to hear Jesus ask, do you love me? And to receive our commission. To follow him. To feed sheep, to feed.
fish for men. May we remember, may we hear again, and may we go in his name. It's in that name we pray. Amen. In picking music for today, I, I found a hymn that um, unfortunately... I don't have copyright permission for us to sing, and, and uh, it's one, that, and, and I, I, for some reason, when I copied this down, I didn't put her name on it, uh, Carolyn, I believe is her name. She, she writes a ton of new words to old hymns, and actually this is suggested with like three different hymn tunes, but it's, it's about this text, and it, it says, Peter said, I'm going fishing, so his friends went out with him. Through the night they labored watching, hauling empty nets back in. In the gray of early morning, Jesus, you came walking by. From the beach, you called a greeting, cast out on the other side. Soon their nets were filled to brimming. Someone cried, it is the Lord. Jumping in, he started swimming. Christ, you met him on the shore. Guiding them to better waters, eating fish and sharing bread, you showed Peter and the others you were risen from the dead. Risen Christ, you send us fishing. God's great sea is everywhere. You have guided us in mission. You have given love to share. Through the years, our church has heard you. We have answered your great call. Cast your nets where I have told you. Bring my word of love to all. Lord, be with our congregation. By your spirit, send us forth. May we care for your creation. May we work for peace on earth. In our worship, in our giving, in our serving those in need, may we know, Lord, you are living, guiding us. In the ministry. That's a talent to be able to, to do that. I wanted to share that with you. We are going to sing, it's in our in our hymnal Scotchman's Baptist, hymn number 541, Jesus Calls or the Tumult. Um, it's also in your worship packet. It's just some simple lines. Um, but in, in going through, making sure that we kind of had what came closest to fit what was in our hymnal, so we're kind of literally singing on the same page. Um, I find, found a couple other versions of this, and actually, apparently, the original poem had a, a another stanza, another verse that we don't um, sing, and most hymnals don't have it. Um, and I actually found it written a, a couple of different ways, translated or, or reformed in a couple of different ways, and and it's often listed as the second verse. Um, I found it start with long ago apostles, also as the first disciples, and I found it as as of old the apostles. But let's let's listen to this version. As of old the apostles heard it by the Galilean lake, turned from home and toil and kindred, leaving all for Jesus' sake. They heard the call, um, and I like that. Several versions of the hymn have that in there. A reminder that Jesus calls us just like he called those first disciples. We don't have that verse. We'll sing the verses. We're given four verses. Jesus calls us for the tumult. Um, hymn number 541. You can stand if you would care to.
thanks for being with us. I'm glad that we could worship together. I hope that you will hear Jesus speaking into your life, calling you to follow him, calling you to take care of his sheep, calling you to a ministry that he has planned for you. And now receive the benediction. Go. Go in the name of the one who calls. Go. Following him. Go into a world that so desperately needs what he has to offer. In that world, be a blessing. And may you be blessed. Amen.